Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today is the day we have everything complete on our Invest Arms Gemmer Hawking kit, and it's time to put it back together. I want to give a shout out to muzzleloaders.com. They gave me a discount on this kit that we're using for the video. Again, by no means is it going to affect kind of the final review of the building process, but I just want to make that clear. If you have any questions about that, please leave them in the comments below so I can answer it publicly and transparently. Because our barrel is kind of the backbone of this kit, I like to put the barrels in first. Uh, so I've got my rear sight started here. You might uh, need to go back through and check your fit after you've rust browned. Um, this dovetail, it might have a little bit of residue there. Um, so go through and check that. You can clean that up real quick with a file and be ready to, to set your rear sight. Now to do this, I've got this set in my vise so I can have a nice solid surface. A little too far there. I just want that to line up on that top face. I've already set my front sight in just like that and I've installed my barrel rib underneath. It's really, really pretty simple. You're just putting those bolts back in there. Um, you know, <laughs> try not to bugger it up as much as I did there. I found that the barrel rib bolts or screws really liked an eighth inch flathead screwdriver. Uh, this is a Craftsman. It fit just about perfectly. Now to get the stock ready to accept the barrel, we can try to decipher our marks that we put on the back of our tenon plates. I will say it's a little bit uh, difficult uh, because the solutions that we used took away a lot or worked on that Sharpie pretty hard. But I think I've got an L1 there and this I think is L2. I've got right two in there. And this just kind of comes down to seeing how these line up and trying to fit them in there. Now because the stock has had some oil soaked in, it is going to swell up quite a bit and make this a little difficult. And just out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to apply a little bit of oil to some of these parts as we put them back in. Thankfully, these kits are really easy to put together and take apart uh, at this stage. It's not that, not that it's not been work up to this point, but cleaning them is, is designed to be pretty, pretty easy. Loosening up that front lock bolt because sometimes getting the barrel into the stock, you need that loosened up a little bit. On these tiny screws, I recommend putting some oil or beeswax on them. I'll help them go in easier. You can see there that went down in nice and flush. So I had a little bit of difficulty getting this rear barrel tenon in. Uh, I knew going into it that it was going to be a little tricky because we had issues with it dry fitting. I ended up doing a lot of material removal with a file on the surface of this. I think the depth for the underlug on the barrel wasn't quite indexed with this. Uh, honestly, it's something I should have fixed before we got to the finish process. Uh, really in the dry fitting process, but I have that fitting now and, and working. You want these to slide in and hold easily. You don't want to have to beat them in with a hammer uh, because you want to be able to take these out and clean, deep, do a deep clean if you need to. But again, you don't necessarily have to. Honestly, for this kit, I will probably just leave these in. Make sure my bore is clean and, and maybe take it out once a year, uh, depending on how much I'm shooting. Next, we can come up here to our nose cap. 
sit in our entry pipe. It's kind of funny how much space you end up using <laughs> as you as you start putting this back together. I mean, it's really a short rifle, but um, I'm clearing off what feels like my entire bench here, trying to get this put together. <laughs> Giving these parts a nice coat of oil all the way around before I drop them in permanently, just so we make sure we have all of our bases covered. Well, our nose cap does not want to go back on with the barrel in, so I think you'll find if you're if you're like me at all, <laughs> if you are, I'm sorry, but um, your final assembly is kind of a hodgepodge. as you try to get everything back together. Now we should be able to drop this on. A little tight because of all the oil we've already put into the wood. But there you can see it's attached nice. You know, remember we rounded out our pins and this one is a little kinked somehow so I'm just gonna straighten it up with my pliers I'm gonna be real gentle putting these back in we don't want to blow out right now and because we've oiled everything everything's real tight That was a little too tight for my comfort. I'm going to get a little drill and just clean this out a little bit just to make sure that we're not going to bust anything. To do this, I've chucked up a number 53 drill bit into this antique hand drill. Really handy for a step like this where I don't need or want any power. flip over to the other side now and do the same thing. This is all slow and steady work. We don't need to go whole hogging it here. I'm just letting that drill bit in that drill just kind of fall into that hole. You can see I'm bringing out just a couple small shavings. Nothing huge, but we don't want anything huge. We just want that to go in, just to clear out some material. Pin goes in much easier now. I gently tap it with my chasing hammer, checking the other side. It looks good, I don't see any daylight coming through that hole. I'm going to carefully and cautiously tap this back in, listening for any cracks. We're looking okay. So we don't have any cracks and I can see here that my pin went through the ramrod entry pipe, which is exactly what we want. Feeling pretty good. Looks good. Went through our entry pipe. I'll flip over and just tap gently with the peen. Just to set that pin a little bit into the stock. You can get out your drive pin punches there if you'd like as well. Um, but as long as you're tapping gently with your peen, you can usually get away with just doing what I did there. You'll see here I'm supporting underneath the stock with a little piece of wood here because the stock gets narrow up here I don't want the stock rocking as I'm doing something like this I want to have full support Okay. now our pin here is a little short so I'm gonna get my drive pin punch and just tap that in a little bit more 
Now I reckon I can put my barrel back in. Hook our breech. Push that in like that. Now that we have our front end secure, I'm gonna come back here to the butt. We'll get our butt plate installed and our toe plate. I set the kit back into my vise with my support stand here to begin adding some of these larger pieces. Um, this kind of gives me two work surfaces. I have my tools and my parts down here and the stock all the way up here. Uh, this way I don't have to go back and forth like I was previously uh, trying to balance everything out. We'll dab oil, clean it up with my oily patch, which is somewhere. Well, like I said, a little dab of oil or, or wax on your screws goes a long way. I don't want to tighten that one up just yet. I want to get both of our uh, screws in here before I lock anything down. A little, little bit of oil there. You'll notice I'm starting all of these with my finger. You don't want to start this with your tool or really a power tool. Please don't ever do that. Because you can get, you can get the wrong way pretty quick and, and really damage something. With a screw like this, these butt plates are never coming out. I want to talk a little bit real quick about screw alignment in relation to muzzle loaders. I don't care if you're building a muzzle loader or if you're putting an electrical box in your house. It's kind of a mark of quality traditionally for all of your screw heads to be in alignment. Um, so like an electrical box, for instance, you'd have them both pointing the same way, either vertically uh, or horizontally, just so everything matches. On a muzzle loader, Typically, all of your screw heads, because they're going to be slotted straight screws, are going to be in alignment with the direction of the stock. Now, you might have an instance like I do up here in my tang, where as it's tightened down, it doesn't quite match. We can come out, shorten that screw a little bit, and, uh, and get that to line up well for us and make sure that all of these are in alignment. By no means is it something that you have to do. It's just the kind of thing that adds another step or level to what you're doing. And uh, it's a little bit of extra time that really adds to it, I think. Flipping up to the underside now, drop my trigger assembly in. You'll notice maybe that this screw didn't really take the browning. So I heated it some and oil quenched it so that it's not too bright. This does get covered by the trigger guard, so I'm not too concerned about it. Set that in like so. I have an extra screw, which I have two. What haven't I attached? I guess we're going to find out. I feel like the cat is trying to warn me of something. Hey, you big dumb idiot, you forgot the thing, the important thing. We can drop our lock in. Flip up. Like so, grab our lock bolt and our lock bolt washer. Give you a little oil before we drop you in. Looks nice and snug up against our barrel. Really just what we want. Now it's at this stage, once you have your lock and your trigger assembly in, you can kind of check to make sure everything still functions. Um, because we disassembled the trigger assembly and uh, had this in and out quite a bit, it's good to make sure that everything works. Because you can take it apart 
and put it back together. So this is just my standard trigger. Notice that didn't work. Okay, with the set trigger it did. And now my set trigger didn't want to set. Got a little too much tension on everything. Okay. Which is normal. I got it just a little too, a little too torqued up, one might say. Easy fix. Let's pop our trigger guard off. We'll make a couple adjustments. After some troubleshooting, I, I adjusted each of these screws. This is our, our front adjustment screw for our front trigger uh, in here between each of the triggers. This adjusts how heavy of a trigger pull you need to set off the front trigger after you've set the set trigger. This back here adjusts this leaf spring and this screw here adjusts how much pressure that leaf spring can have on your set trigger. So originally when I put this back together I'm still not sure that I'm right. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit more investigation here. But originally I had this front trigger spring. You can see I had it up here in this top notch. And that, I was getting some really funky triggers. Uh, it was really mushy, really weird, really not repetitive uh, trigger motion. Uh, did a little research here and I think I've got it right. I've got this front spring for our front trigger down into the bottom groove of our front trigger here. And with that, my set screw resets every time. I do have two clicks there as it sets, but I've got a nice crisp trigger. It breaks away just how I want. So I'm, I'm hoping that that was the issue I had. That's just kind of my nice, uh, that's just kind of my inexperience really affecting me there. So I'm gonna set this back in We'll try this again. So we'll set our set trigger, half cock, close our pan, come up to full cock. Oh, man, that's exactly what I want. Perfect. Okay. I like that a lot better than we had. Uh, if it is wrong, please let me know. But I feel. I feel pretty good about that. I've got a nice solid trigger. I have a light enough trigger that I'm not going to be yanking this uh, as I'm trying to get it to go off, but it's still sturdy enough that I wouldn't uh, be too nervous about it going off unexpectedly. This just takes a little trial and error. I mean, you know, I, I'm still learning as well on a lot of this stuff. I swear, you know, you really can get ahead quite a bit if you uh, have a local club in your area and ask some of the guys there. Many times they're gonna be happy to help you. With that installed, we'll just give it another test here. That's working good. We'll come up here and add our trigger plate, or <laughs> Come up here now and add our toe plate. I gotta get better at my flat-headed screws. So now that we've got everything put back together, all of our parts fit, everything meshes nicely, and we have all of our screws aligned. So now that we have everything put back together, all of our screws are aligned and everything fits, it's time for really the absolute last step of this kit and of, of any kit that you're building at home or any muzzleloader that you're building at home. That's gonna be applying some oil to the stock. Like I said earlier, we wanna apply this when all of the parts are put back together and everything's sealed up and ready to go because this wood's gonna swell with the application of oil and really seal up around all of our parts and inlet. For this kit, the whole time I've used a natural finish Danish oil, so that's what I'm gonna be finishing up with. You can use whatever oil that you prefer. You can ask a lot of muzzleloader builders or kit builders, uh, and they're gonna tell you their preferred oil. True oil is one of the main go-tos for people. It's kind of a classic, traditional 
muzzle loader oil uh, for your stock and, and for the wood. Uh, there's also like boiled linseed oil, uh, tongue oil, you know, there's a whole plethora of oils that you can go through and finish up. Some guys will put a, a modern polyurethane finish over their stock to really seal it up and protect it from the weather. I don't personally do that. I've not seen any original muzzle loaders with that kind of, uh, of finish on it and uh, I'm okay with it seeing some age and things. Now if you're in the Pacific Northwest or in kind of a rainforest climate, you know, you might trend towards kind of that water sealant finish on it. But I think as long as you're filling the wood grain with an oil at this step, you're going to be fine. I'm being gentle as I apply these coats because I have that bone black on the surface. And underneath that surface, I have those faux ink striped lines. These aren't necessarily a permanent finish. Uh, so I think over time they could wear, which is fine for me. This is going to be a user muzzle loader. I don't want it to be in this condition that it is in 2022 in 20 or 30 years. I want it to have some of those natural wear patterns. And if some of the finish I've applied now wears off and is replaced with a used finish, uh, you know, from actual use and shooting, I'm fine with that. If you want this to stay pristine, you're going to want to be very careful as you go through and apply these coats. I guess not very careful. Just don't take an abrasive brush, scotch brighter sandpaper to the stock if you followed the same techniques that I have. What you're seeing here is probably about the fourth or fifth coat of the Danish oil that I've applied to this stock. The old adage is a coat of oil every hour for a day, every day for a week, every week for a month, every month for a year. So really this being the last step, you can consider this an ongoing process. I find though that after, you know, six, seven, eight coats of oil, you know, over the course of a month, uh, your stock's really not going to take a whole lot more oil. Uh, really for me, the continued application of oil comes after a range day where I'll just hit the whole rifle with a coat of oil to get everything cleaned up and, and prevent some further rust after I've shot and used it. But again, just like with everything else, when it comes to building a muzzleloader, you're going to get a lot of different opinions and a lot of different ideas on it. I just present what I do uh, just as what I do. You don't have to do it and, and by no means is it the only way to do it. So I apply the oil pretty wet uh, and get quite a bit on there and then as it kind of sits and dry, thankfully in some good summer heat here this time of year, I'll come back through it and daub any of that excess off of there that's not absorbing just to make sure we're not getting a sticky residue on here. As you can see, that stock's still soaking up that oil, even with this being quite a few coats in. Overall, I'm really pleased with how this kit turned out. This is kind of a, a, a intermediary kit for me. I think this is my third or fourth muzzleloader kit that I've built now. Um, and I think I took this one a little bit farther than I have some of the other kits that I've worked with. Uh, I did a lot more finish work on the stock here than I have done any of the other kits that I've had uh, from the from the oiling to the striping to the bone black and the shaping in general. We spent a lot of time in the shop there shaping the stock to get it right and get it to where I wanted it to be. Real quick, I'd like to thank muzzleloaders.com for giving me the opportunity to build this kit. I'm pretty pleased with how the Invest Arms kit put, went together here and I'm gonna have a full review kind of talking about the build process for this kit specifically in another video in addition to like a, a later shooting review as we get uh, some more range time with this. But uh, I'd just like to thank them and I'd like to thank Invest Arms for giving me this opportunity. I had a lot of fun building this kit and I hope that uh, some of the other folks of you out there that have purchased one of these kits uh, have an option to, uh, to finish it up and get it out to the range. I'd also like to thank Bob Woodfill for publishing his book, The Hawk and Rifle. Uh, it's a great resource and it served as a great uh, sounding board and a great guideline for me as I was building this. While this isn't a 100% you know, historically accurate hawk and rifle, uh, that book, I believe, has a lot of great resource in there for you to, to inspire you and, and maybe guide some of your building uh, as you're building a, even a production hawking kit like this. Kind of give some notes of that original history in there. So I'd like to thank Bob again for publishing the great book and being a good friend and offering me as much advice as he has over the years. The only thing left to do now is to give it its first few shots here 
on the range and see how it performs. Now it seems like a lot of work to get your muzzleloader to this point, but we're not quite done yet really with the life of this muzzleloader. Now that we're at the range, it's, it's time to start thinking about load development and what balls and what powder this is gonna like and what powder charge it's going to like. But that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit later in another video. This is now kind of a, a point for celebration now and I encourage you to do the same when you finish your kit. Take it to the range, start burning some powder with it and enjoy it. It's a lot of work goes into any level of muzzleloader that you build, whether you're building a kit or from a blank. And uh, it's hard to beat the, uh, the feeling when you get to the range and you're finally able to shoot it. As I get started here, I'm gonna run a dry patch down my bore. Uh, because we oiled this during the rusting process and wanted to get it cleaned up. I just want to make sure I get a lot of that oil residue out of there so it doesn't dampen any of my black powder. Put my jag back in my bag. I oh, know I'm going to get a lot of questions uh, about the setup for this. I'll talk about this a little bit more in depth, um, but I guess it, it's really another thank you. Um, I've got this bag here I'm setting up for this Invest Arms Hawken. It's a nice double pouched really black simple leather bag with some exterior uh, stitching here and a beautiful st louis style horn uh, it's a bison horn with a nice pinwheel decoration there on the back uh, and some beautiful white horn plugs up here at the front this set uh, comes from my good friend max egoff uh, max passed away uh, earlier this month and um, <laughs> he wanted to see this kit done and i'm Kind of sad that I didn't get it done in time for him to see it, but I'm very pleased to have this kit, have this set up uh, from him on the range here uh, to kind of keep him with me a little bit as I'm shooting this kit and, and as I continue my journey into muzzleloading. I'm gonna start just as I do with all of my 50 caliber muzzleloaders with a measured charge of 50 grains. Now I'm shooting some Schutzen 2F black powder, pouring it here into my powder measure. Make sure I plug my horn. I've got a pre-patched and pre-lubed round ball here. This is a 495 round ball, and I'm using some of Frontier's Bear Grease uh, patch lube and rust preventative. This is some really good stuff. It comes naturally from, uh, from a real bear, which is kind of neat. Kind of fits in with the Hawken. And I'm just loading directly from that block. Making sure we have it tamped down, just like you would with any Flint lock. I'm going to go ahead and put my ears in now. Set it on half cock to prime it. A little priming horn here with some 4F powder. We don't need much. Close our frizz and we're ready to go. We got a little red coat target down there. It's kind of real close to the 4th of July here as a recording. So it felt natural like we needed to get a little patriotic here with our flint lock muzzle litter. But that first shot, you know, went off pretty well for me. Uh, this is using one of those agate cut flints in here. I think uh, down the road, it's the kind of thing that you might want to replace with an English or a French flint. It's a pretty small lock, so you're going to want a pretty small flint for it. But uh, as far as that first shot goes, pretty good performance, I think. We're going to go ahead and load up a couple more here and uh, take a few more shots just because we've got it out and we're having fun. I'll tell you, it feels good to shoot, uh, shoot one of the kits that you've built really just the fun part you know the all the other stuff is the building is fun but it's hard to compete with the fun of getting out and shooting with your muzzleloader I went ahead and spent the rest of my high capacity muzzleloader magazine here on this on this red coat target I'm gonna give you a base look here we've got a nice group with our last few shots there the rest of the target is a little bit funky as we're trying to figure this rifle out. We got to adjust our sight picture some, but as far as a first range test goes with this kit, it works, it shoots, and I can get some holes touching on paper offhand at 25 yards. It's a great place to start for a first outing for your muzzleloader kit. Now I can stretch this out to 100 yards to 50 yards and start playing with the charges with that 495 ball. I think that's a good place for these Hawken rifles to kind of sit at. You can go up to a tighter ball if you wanted to. It's gonna make it a little bit more difficult to load 
I really recommend having a nice patch lube like I was using uh, that Frontiers Bear Grease patch lube. Good stuff, really like using it, comes in a big can. So, you know, not sponsored or anything, just like using those kind of products. And it's by somebody who supports the community, which I think is pretty cool. I'd like to thank you really quick for coming onto this journey with me. Uh, it means a lot, each and every one of you that left a comment and, and shot me an email about it. Um, I hope that I provided you with some insight into how I do this and maybe how you can do it yourself. As always, I'm not an expert and I uh, really just want to talk about muzzleloading and, and share my love of muzzleloading. So if there's something that you think I could be doing better or differently, please let me know. You can shoot me an email or you can uh, leave a comment in the video. And, uh, and if you see me at a show, please stop me and talk with me about it. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you again so much for coming along this Gemmer Hawken journey with me. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the muzzleloading season.